thank you for the opportunity to come and speak to you today. Um, there's a lot of friends uh, in the audience, so it's great to catch up with um, past friends from our MST time, uh, new colleagues and obviously people online. Um, this morning I think is a really good opportunity for us to talk about the journey of evidence-based policing in New Zealand. Uh, you, for those that were here last night, you would have heard from our police commissioner about the journey that we've been taking in New Zealand for about five years. Um, so this morning, Simon and I want to talk about uh, the journey that we've taken, uh, some of the research that we've delivered to enable strategic and operational decision making within our own organisation, um, some of the challenges because it hasn't all been plain sailing, um, and then where we sort of see New Zealand police taking evidence-based um, policing for us and the opportunities that we see globally um, to collaborate um, and partner with other jurisdictions. Just a little bit of um, context uh, for those that don't know a lot about New Zealand Police. So we were formed in 1886. Prior to that we were in an armed co um, constabulary. Um, we've got one police service in New Zealand, so we're responsible for uh, law enforcement functions and national security. Um, we strongly mirror the metropolitan police hierarchy um, and the model of policing. Um, policing by consent is a fundamental part of um, our operating model and we'll talk a little bit about that um, soon. Um, we've got about 11,000 police officers um, and about 4,000 support staff from intelligence analysts, um, data scientists that Simon and I work with on a regular basis and researchers. Um, our indigenous people, uh, Māori, they make up 14% of our population, um, a real big challenge for us in New Zealand. Unfortunately, they, they make up about 53% of our prison population overrepresented in um, all the bad statistics in New Zealand, so there's a lot of work for us to do as a police organisation but the wider sector to lower um, some of those harmful statistics that we see play out. Um, we're a relatively safe country. Um, you see these global scores around safeness. Um, New Zealand always scores um, really high there, but we do have a lot of emerging crime um, trends in New Zealand, especially organised crime. Um, we've seen a bit of a marked um, challenge that's coming into New Zealand in the last few years with deportations coming out of Australia, so New Zealand citizens that have been committing serious offences in Australia have come to New Zealand a lot more sophisticated in their crime networks and that's um, posing a real big problem for us. Methamphetamine, unfortunately, is a huge driver of crime in New Zealand, um, accounts for a lot of um, uh, family harm, family violence, uh, organised crime, um, street violence, mental health, so it's a really big problem uh, in New Zealand. We're one of the highest consumers per head of population for methamphetamine. Um, we're like every other organisation, data rich. Um, a lot of the time we don't know what to do with it. Um, we sit on terabytes of the stuff, um, but we're a very data driven organisation. Um, you would have heard from our commissioner um, and he sort of gave a bit of a sentiment about um, how we're using data and analytics and research to drive our, our organisation, which is really good. And legitimacy is a really big focus for us in New Zealand. So we sort of look at the four pillars of legitimacy. Um, and we're really focused about how we ensure that it's embedded in our organisation, it's a daily conversation and we're, getting, uh, we're constantly looking for continuous improvement to help us attack some of those issues around disproportionality for some members of our community. This here is what we call our business in New Zealand, it's our strategy on a page. Um, we were like a lot of other forces around the world, our annual strategic uh, priorities were like a phone book, um, nobody really read them um, and they sort of sat on people's desks until the following year. In 2017 we redeveloped um, our strategic intent under the previous Commissioner Mike Bush and um, we first saw evidence-based policing and for the first time um, it appeared on our business uh, as one of the core functions around how we were going to make New Zealand um, the safest country, so that's our mission. Um, and it was a bit of a step change for us because for those of us that were advocating using evidence-based policing, it was a really step change for us that we had our executive support um, behind us to actually go exploring about what was possible in this space. And our previous Commissioner Mike Bush um, sort of laid down the challenge that we wanted to be data-driven, we wanted to be research-driven and he saw a real opportunity to leverage what evidence-based policing could help us with um, around reducing harm. And the, um, the, one, the one on the right hand side there is um, the latest version um, that was refreshed in April 2020 under Commissioner Costa um, and again evidence based policing features um, uh, a lot throughout that um, uh, strategic plan and most parts of the business now will talk about um, how evidence based policing will enable them uh, for their responsibilities. So just a bit of a um, 
a little bit of history before we move into what we've been doing. Um, so we, we sort of set the centre up in 2017 in name only. Um, so we had to find the resources. So we had a lot of resources um, and working in silos across our organisation from data scientists, researchers, performance analysts, um, continuous improvement, so on. Uh, so it was about bringing all those um, different work groups together under one centre. We created about another 15 positions uh, within the centre um, to complement what we already had and we built the centre of about 65 staff. But we also knew it was important to partner with um, uh, community organisations um, and our corporate partners. So we went out and we had one academic uh, partner, was our initial um, uh, tender that we went out to ensure that we had the right academic support um, for our research and ensure it was robust and rigorous. So we partnered with the University of Waikato. Um, we also partnered with the Environmental Science Research um, Centre, which is a Crown Institute. They do all our forensic assessments, but they wanted to move more into the social science uh, sciences and they've also got a lot of data scientists that support us on initiatives as well and then we also partnered with our technology partner Vodafone that had been supplying um, technology to New Zealand Police for about seven years at that point um, for mobility devices so um, like a lot of jurisdictions our staff carry um, mobility devices and uh, Vodafone wanted to be part of this journey as well so they provided um, uh, an innovation hub um, that was originally designed for uh, the mobility um, component of our business, but that was uh, transferred into our service design um, part of the evidence-based policing centre. Um, just really quickly, um, one of the key uh, criteria for our blueprint, so we actually wanted to have some success criteria that we wanted to achieve in the first couple of years. Um, so that was enabling our strategic intent. Um, we wanted to contribute to the body of knowledge, not only in New Zealand, but internationally uh, around all things policing and, and harm reduction. Um, we wanted to integrate evidence-based policing into how we worked, so it was actually at the front end rather than retrospectively thinking about um, assessing impact, we actually wanted to get at the front end. Um, and we also wanted to create strong partnerships, not only in New Zealand but internationally with other jurisdictions and academics that shared the same <coughs> aspirations as us. Thanks Bruce, and as, as you probably heard our Commissioner uh, talk to last night, this, this didn't happen by accident. Creating an evidence-based policing centre in New Zealand has been a, a long-term plan and probably was in the making over the course of about seven or eight years. Um, and the blueprint is, uh, is the plan that enabled us to establish and then start to embed an evidence-based policing centre. But as, as Bruce said, we, took, we, we had some initial establishment partners, um, but like everything, no, no, no plan, no blueprint survives contact, does it? Uh, the political environment changes, um, uh, the police executive leadership change. So we're updating and reviewing this blueprint now. So we're looking forward into the next sort of three, four, five years at how we cr create and build an operating model for evidence-based policing that makes this stick. So it's not just reliant on one or two people being champions of, of, of EBP. Um, so yeah, we want to go back to um, kind of what are the core principles of evidence-based policing and what does that mean for uh, EBP in New Zealand. Um, so there's a little bit of work to do to further integrate um, uh, an evidence-based approach with the Royal New Zealand Police College as well. So the Royal New Zealand Police College, uh, it's like any police academy or learning uh, centre in, in uh, England and Wales, I guess, where uh, our cops learn how to go and police. They learn how to use force, etc. The legislation, what they don't learn about is problem solving or evidence based, what the evidence base tells us. So there's more work to be done there as well. And I think one of the core cool things, I, I, I get a little bit of a green eyed monster uh, coming back here and listening to all the wonderful testing that's going on. Um, and of course, you know, we're, we've taken a long term view of establishing an evidence based policing centre in New Zealand. So it's growing slowly, and you'll see as we go through this presentation that we, we are testing. Uh, we are running a number of RCTs, but it's difficult, right? Uh, so coming here and listening to all the wonderful testing that's going on uh, through the Institute is, is fantastic. Bruce mentioned uh, the, 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 the establishment partners, and these are our two key uh, partners. Um, the one I'll that I'm going to talk about really is the University of Waikato. Um, so they're one of our, our largest universities in uh, New Zealand. They're in the uh, north of the North Island. Um, and it would be fair to say that we've been on a bit of a journey together. It's probably taken us two years to work each other out. Um, the University of Waikato didn't really have um, the staff or even the students actually uh, initially that we thought that they would have and COVID of course interrupted 
absolutely everything, but they've hired really, really well over the last 12 to 18 months, and so that partnership's just grown from strength to strength now. Uh, so it's important to have the, the right people. And we've got a long-term agreement with them to um, work on understanding the impact over the next 10 years of our flagship alternative resolution called Tiparanga, which of course has got family group conferencing and restorative justice at the heart of it. Yeah, so when uh, the centre first got established, um, one of the strategic moves from the organisation is that they wanted an operational police officer to lead it. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be um, uh, selected as the first director of evidence-based policing. And in my background, certainly not academic, um, I was fortunate enough to come and do the MST programme, but um, my background is an op operational um, police officer, um, both in operations and investigations. So I'd sort of come up through the organisation, um, uh, doing everything uh, that everybody before me had done um, and then I come over to this program and, I, and I'm picking a lot of you in the audience, especially on the MST program, that first lecture you're like why haven't I heard about this stuff before and I'd been in the job about 17 years at that point. So um, the opportunity to lead this for our organisation was a great privilege but um, when I was setting the centre up I made a real um, deliberate choice of bringing in a range of different academics. So uh, as an example, my research manager um, that we brought in um, has a background in exercise science. Um, we've got people that have um, worked in psychology and criminology, so there's a real diverse way of thinking about problems. And that's really set us up well, I think, to deal with a lot of the complex problems that policing is now having to adapt to. Um, so, you know, the, the role of policing has expanded significantly in the last 40 years, but it, it, even in the last 10 years significantly, especially when you look at things like mental health, etc. So we made sure that, um, there was, that, that I was there to be able to connect to the operational staff, um, operational leaders within our organisation, understanding some of those challenges that they have to deal with at 2 o'clock in the morning, um, but also uh, ensuring that our academics that were on board with us had that real diverse range of um, uh, thinking about problems that were happening in communities that they were part of as well. So that was, um, it was a real sort of deliberate um, approach that we took within our organisation. It's just worth saying, and uh, I think Jeff uh, Barnes would agree, that evidence-based policing in Western Australia didn't fail because of the fantastic work that we'd done. But we, we weren't not providing great value. We weren't not uncovering new evidence and providing great insight. Uh, far from it, actually. Um, it failed because of the culture and because of the politics. As simple as that. So you can have the best plan in the world. And, and that's really to the point here is that New Zealand Police have given us a mandate, Bruce and I, to really shape up the evidence-based policing centre and, and, and establish it and grow and expand it um, in, in a way that, um, in, the, in the way that we want to. So we want to expose people to a different way of thinking and, and expose people to um, the, the evidence. Um, I think we're both acutely aware though that nothing ever stays the same in policing. Um, so I think it'd be fair to say at the moment we are, we've got um, Inspector Simon Welsh who's on the uh, first year of the programme which is fantastic but we've made a commitment in the last couple of days to bring more students uh, across to this course from New Zealand um, because it's that succession planning is incredibly important as well. Who are the next people that are going to come and lead EBP um, for New Zealand Police? As I said, our commissioner wanted to be data-driven, uh, research-driven, and actually the day of uh, the launch of evidence-based policing, uh, the centre, um, we unfortunately had the Christchurch terror attack, uh, which saw 51 people lose their lives in Christchurch and uh, another 40 um, that were significantly injured um, as a result of a uh, terrorist. And Commissioner Bush, um, uh, at that stage, wanted to test evidence-based policing around decision-making for our executive because they had some pretty big decisions to make. One of them in particular was um, the reassurance of communities post a terror attack. And in New Zealand, um, we had been fortunate to that point that we'd never suffered anything like that. We'd had um, an incident back in 1987 where a Greenpeace ship was um, bombed in Auckland Harbour, but outside of that, we would really never suffered some of the challenges that you, you have in the UK and, and other parts of the world. So. Commissioner Bush had two questions that he posed to me um, within sort of 12 hours of the event. One was how do we reassure our communities, diverse communities, post the terror attack. The second one is that we were grappling with, as a genuinely, genuinely unarmed police service, we have access to firearms, um, all our staff were armed and they remained armed for six weeks. And there, there was this bit of a political debate going on in New Zealand about is it time for New Zealand police to be genuinely armed? Um, and the executive had to grapple with that. So as a result, um, the centre pulled together fundamentally two literature reviews around evidence 
um, that other jurisdictions in, in, in other parts of the world had experienced. Um, and we looked to Norway around the, the unarmed versus armed debate. And the two questions that we looked at, are our people, being the police officers, and the public safer um, if the police are armed? And then the other, the other area that we looked at, as I said, was that around that reassurance. Now, they were pulled together relatively quickly. Yes, it was just literature reviews, but it was the first time that I'd seen an executive using the best available evidence to make some really key strategic decisions. And it was a real catalyst for change. I saw, within a very short time, other members of our police executive going, actually, there's something in this. Um, what are these other opportunities that I have in my work group, be it district operations, investigations, to t start testing and using evidence to inform our decision making. So it's just a couple of small examples that happened virtually at day one. Um, and I think it really allowed us to have that mandate to start um, working with wider parts of the organisation. But unfortunately, it took a significant event like that um, uh, to sort of start that journey. So one of the things that um, Bruce asked me to do when I first uh, arrived was, OK, well, how do we explain to the, a whole organisation what evidence-based policing is? And what I would say is that we've got quite a broad model. We've got quite a broad range of uh, teams and disciplines under the banner of evidence-based policing. Uh, every one of you that works in a police agency uh, in this room and if online, you will have exactly the same resources and teams available to you. You'll just really like to find that they're in disparate parts of disparate parts of your business. And as Bruce said, there was a very modest investment in a small number of staff, a, a couple of do a, a dozen or so staff. Uh, coming into the implementation evaluation area that um, Simon Welsh uh, leads now. But we put this prospectus together really to explain what each of those component parts of the centre did, didn't do. And I was listening to, on the plane on the way over here, listening to um, uh, Jerry Ratcliffe's podcast, the Reducing Crime podcast. I think he recently spoke to Jackie Sabir, who's also a graduate of this, of, of this course. Um, and they were uh, laughing about, you know, police doing things and then going go, go to researchers and saying, OK, we've done this. Can you tell me whether it worked or not? So it's one of the things that we had to really uh, work hard to do to say to our people, look, what you've done is a great baseline, but we probably need to start again if we're going to actually test and be able to understand the impact of, of what you are doing. The other thing that we did early in 2019, uh, we wanted to give our people across the organisation a voice in all of this as well. So this is much about getting under people's skin and changing their way of thinking about evidence and evidence-based policing. So we wanted to create a strategic research agenda. So like any of your police agencies, New Zealand Police funds lots of people to do uh, master's degrees, PhDs, um, across a whole range of universities, including Cambridge. Um, so we spoke from every book to, to people across the organisation, district commander, district leadership teams, um, our police executive, the leads of our service centres, and said, what are the gnarly problems that you come up against every single year? What are those drivers of crime? What are the, things that, what are the questions that you've got that you want answers to? And so we pulled together the strategic research agenda based on the voice of our people. Um, and this is what we try to map all of our research to and all of our work projects that come through our task and coordination process, uh, we pin them back to those four key areas. Um, and we found that really useful in having conversations with our um, external university partners as well. So we're now partnering with pretty much every university across uh, New Zealand, and this is uh, central to that. I mentioned earlier that this evidence-based policing centre didn't happen by accident, and there was a plan uh, and a blueprint to, to bring this together. All of our people um, across New Zealand have got a mobility device. And on the mobility device, there is uh, an application called Checkpoint. So um, we run this app. So the Evidence-Based Policing Centre runs this app. And it's really built on um, uh, a book called Checklist Manifesto, um, a book written by a chap called Atul Gwande, um, really uh, trying to pull out the key uh, important things in a checklist for our people to remember when they're dealing with everything from family harm incidents to maybe going through the door and uh, making an arrest in, in, in a warrant, uh, firearms, critical incidents, you name it, it's all in there. So it's a relatively new um, application, but the branding, so this is a branding and marketing exercise. So every single day, every single operational cop in New Zealand opens this application up, significantly heavy use, and they see the EBPC brand. So you talk about relevance, so how do you make evidence-based policing relevant to the front line? 
well, every day our people see this, uh, and then that, that helps them, I think, to, uh, to, to, to understand kind of um, how EBP um, can help them in a very small way. The other thing that we um, were really mindful of is when we started going around to our districts and speaking to frontline staff, they were sort of saying, well, where do we find good research? Um, and that's always a challenge um, to sort of point people in the right direction. So again, we made a, um, an investment in pulling together a portal that sits on our intranet. Um, fundamentally, it's Google for cops. Um, and we went out <clears throat> and looked for the best available evidence on a range of different topics from burglary, car crime, um, nighttime economies, assaults, counter-terrorism, uh, the real wide gambit of everything that police um, have to do deal with. Um, and put it into one place for our people to go to. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we're sort of grading that. Yeah, so we've got, um, as part of the centre, we've got um, the police library. So the New Zealand police invest quite significantly. We've got three full-time librarians. Uh, we pay about $250,000 a year in subscriptions to the uh, journal databases. Um, and uh, we've got about 3,000 articles now and pieces of evidence that our cops can just lay their fingers on um, in this portal. One of the things that we sat down with our librarians when we first set the centre up was, look, there's this thing called the Maryland Scale, um, and actually we, we really want you to screen the evidence that you're putting in against that. We're not really interested in opinions. What we want is evidence. So um, we've invested quite significantly in uh, leading our library team, and uh, they're called our knowledge and information um, uh, uh, team uh, to, to actually put in the best quality evidence in here they possibly can. It's actually, it's actually, <laughs> it's actually morphed into more of an, a, a, a centre page. Actually, as you can see, it's quite busy. Um, it's in kind of MVP format and probably needs to be reworked. But we get 500 unique uh, visitors to this every um, 500 unique visitors to this every week, and people drawing down information on everything from armed policing to intelligence to community policing. Um, and you'll find all of our reports on there. And as a centre, we've um, uh, pub internally published about 80 reports uh, and evaluations over the last couple of years. So that's, um, that helps our people. The other thing that I was really mindful of when I started as the director was the conduit between um, the centre and the academics and um, our data scientists back to the operational um, part of the business. And uh, for me, the real step change has been uh, our network leads, uh, which Inspector Simon Welsh um, uh, led initially and, and now he um, uh, looks after um, implementation and evaluation. But for me that's been the step change. Um, those members that you can see in that photo there, um, including Simon, uh, have a range of different backgrounds. Um, most of them have been operational police officers um, but uh, have gone on to continue education. So they've got the, the right set of skills to go out to a district commander and say what's your biggest challenge at the moment, um, what's keeping you up at night and then working with them to try new things, test new things, um, and bring the right skills in from the centre to connect with the district. And I think, for me, it's probably been the best way we've leveraged the buy-in from not only frontline leaders, but frontline officers. So um, these, the, these teams work with, uh, right down to neighbourhood policing team level, um, and have worked on a number of different initiatives uh, right up and down the country. And if I could, this would be the team that I'd grow the most because I see a lot of benefit coming out of um, that connectivity between uh, our practitioners out on the street and um, uh, obviously our researchers and, and our academics in the centre. And for me, it's been, it's been a huge, huge step change for us. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. Um, one of the, this, this is probably, I mean, we shouldn't have favourites, right, but this is one of my most favourite parts of the, uh, the centre and the projects that they work on um, are outstanding. I mean, there's a, a whole list there and that scratches the surface, but probably half of those are small-scale randomised control trials. Um, the guy on the right-hand side there, he's got 34 years service and he is, it's just, it's, he's a breath of fresh air still about, about this stuff. Um, so the, the big thing about this team is that they're embedded in a district and they've got a seat at the table. Uh, we were talking over dinner last night um, to Heather about the importance of this. So, you know, we've got governance with a big G at a strategic level and, and Bruce and I do our best to be across most of those governance groups and we've got a seat at the table there. But these guys and girls, they are at their area and district tasking and coordination. 
they're part of the CCI, so critical command information, they're part of that uh, process and that discussion. So again, rather than, oh, can you tell us whether this has worked, actually they've got a seat at the table, so they're there when the problems are being discussed and the response, deci or decisions on response, the so what, you know, now what we're going to do, uh, are being made. So um, yeah, they're, uh, they're a group that we're trying to grow, uh, so we're investing in another couple of positions here. Um, and I think watching the growth of, these, uh, of, this, of this team over the last couple of years, we bring them into Wellington every quarter and we put a whole week's worth of uh, professional development in place for them um, and bring speakers in from universities and uh, online. But we're watching that permeate out into the district. So they lead and they grow their own set of champions within each of those districts as well. Um, so it's another example of how we're kind of making it operationally relevant for people um, so we can understand impact. When we kick the centre off, um, everyone wants quick wins, don't they? Um, so it's like, right, what can we do? Can you, can you, run, can, can, can you do us a hotspots policing experiment? Um, so we planned this in, um, in, in, in mid to late 2019, and um, you know, I had the pleasure of working with Jeff over in uh, Western Australia, where we uh, managed somehow uh, to run quite a, <laughs> quite, quite a groundbreaking um, uh, trial in... Um, not just initial deterrence, but residual deterrence with, with hotspots police. And so we, did a we went for a straight replication across two districts uh, in New Zealand. Um, and uh, good as gold, no plan survives contact. Um, and despite our best efforts, um, our officers over the course of about um, uh, three or four months managed to deliver exactly the same amount of patrol time and frequency of visits on every single day, regardless of what we'd ask them to go, and, uh, regardless of what we'd ask them to go and do. Now, there were some learnings in there because um, although, you know, in England and Wales, for those of you who are from here, that you've got airway radios, there's a mobility program, and you retain the location data of your officers. In New Zealand, we don't do that yet. So this was a, real, this was a really first test of actually using location data from phones, um, and we didn't get it quite right, which is why we missed uh, the, the, the tracking on, uh, on control days. The, um, the, the, the beauty of this, though, is that offered us the opportunity to, um, before, we, before we moved into uh, the actual patrol phase of this, we said to our people, well, um, how good is your experience alone at predicting where crime will concentrate? Now, we did this in Western Australia as well, and, and I think we've, we've published a, a very small as, a article on this, but we spoke to 250 operational cops across those two districts, and this is the kind of thing we did. We got these huge maps, and we said, right, based on these kind of crime types, where do you think in the next 12 months crime uh, will concentrate? We heard yesterday uh, a reference to uh, the work that Ellie Macbeth did with PSNI and how their sergeants <coughs> set in patrol areas um, for their uh, deployment didn't get it right most of the time. In Western Australia, it was about the same level as PSNI. Well, the good news here, in, um, in, in New Zealand at least, is that um, they did a little better. So, out of 1,000 uh, total, 1,034 uh, predictions that were made by our people, um, they were accurate 56% um, of the time. That's not bad. But it goes to show, well, what about the rest 40, what about the 40, what about the other 40%? <laughs> so, um, what we're starting to do now is uh, a piece of work with our National Intelligence Centre to actually build in and operationalise hotspots uh, policing as a strategy that can be continually tracked, mapped, um, and when we finally switch the retention of data on, we'll actually be able to start testing. Um, and so look out for that later this year, that's, um, that's the plan. And it really goes on to the, the importance of uh, that just right uh, patrol, and, and this is a, a quote from uh, Gladwell's book, I'm sure many of you will have read, and it's uh, a Larry, a quote that's taken uh, from uh, your, your interview in there with, uh, with Malcolm, but it's, it's absolutely uh, spot on. It's why it's so important. You know, if our people are getting it wrong almost half of the time, how do we help understand where we're over-policing and where we're under-policing? How do we hit that sweet spot? Because we know when you get it right, in the Western Australia example uh, that leads to this, we know that you can start saving money, you can start having a different conversation with your community about what type of patrol and how much and how often is required to prevent and, and uh, prevent harm uh, in particular. Another area that probably didn't go as well as um, we had planned was, as I said, New Zealand police don't routinely carry firearms, um, but unfortunately we had a 
a number of uh, events. Uh, uh, firearms related events uh, towards police um, and uh, one of the big challenges that the Commissioner at that stage faced was well, how are we going to respond to it? We carry firearms in our cars but do we need extra tactical capability out on the streets? So um, we modelled uh, a, a vehicle um, very similar to your ARVs here in the UK, we called them um, armed response teams and um, we, Simon and I were asked to run the evaluation on the pilot, um, we provided some advice about how we thought that the um, pilot should be designed and led and um, evaluated. And as we all know in policing, uh, everything has to be pretty agile. And the advice that we sort of provided at that stage, not all of it was taken on board, um, especially the piece around the community voice, um, around especially that, that key piece around legitimacy and, and, and working with your community. So as a result, a pilot was launched. Um, there were vehicles that were put into our communities that our public hadn't seen before, so very militarised type vehicles, um, uh, very dark blue, completely um, foreign uh, to what we were used to seeing in police vehicles. And these um, response teams went out to communities without any consultation, um, predominantly policing communities that already had low trust and confidence in police. Um, and the questions started coming in, well, why are they here? What's the problem you're trying to deal with? Um, and there was no sort of standard operating procedures either. So you saw a lot of these vehicles conducting routine traffic stops, um, speaking to members of the public on the side of the road, heavily armed um, uh, for, for a New Zealand context. So it was really problematic. Um, and uh, again, we had some challenges with the implementation and the evaluation aspect, but as a result, we lost that tactical capability because the new police commissioner come in and um, didn't really have many options available to him but to uh, pause the pilot and pose the question about well what's next we can't we can't certainly go down this track because we were losing trust and confidence with our communities um, and I think it was a real missed opportunity and it was it was a real big learning for Simon and I about how do we better influence um, uh, strategic decision makers bring them um, um, some clarity about what some of those consequences would, could be if you don't sort of get some real good uh, rigour around what you want to test. And um, as a result, uh, we've moved on to a new model, which Simon will talk to uh, about soon. But one of the, the real big issues that we saw was we paused the pilot in April of 2020, um, and our frontline staff um, were big supporters because they felt a lot safer. So that was one of the key findings out of the evaluation is that our staff felt safer um, with these vehicles in the community. We couldn't test if they were safer because, um, again, we sort, of, we sort of rushed to the implementation phase. But um, unfortunately, two months later, we had a young officer murdered um, on the streets of Auckland after stopping a vehicle. Now, I'm not saying that the, 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 the ART would have prevented that, but um, it certainly started to affect some of the trust and confidence within our organisation uh, for, our, for our leaders. Um, so as a result of that, um, Simon, you'll touch on the TRM model that we're, we're evaluating at the moment. Yeah, I think Bruce is spot on. It, it, was, it was done with the right intent, but um, really the delivery uh, did, of this didn't, did, didn't, uh, didn't land at all. But just for context, it's probably worth saying that in New Zealand, we're probably the most armed, unarmed police service anywhere in the world. So um, every uh, frontline cop has got access to um, uh, a, a, a rifle and sidearm in the, a lockbox um, in the back of their patrol car. Um, <clears throat> what we found was the, the training um, that they go through in those initial stages of their service probably didn't leave them feeling confident in their own skills and abilities in dealing with those critical dynamic um, incidents. So the tactical response model really built on some of the learnings from uh, the uh, failed arm response team uh, rollout. We did some work in between time as well and all of this is published online externally actually. It's called the Appropriate Tactical Settings Paper. Um, and we went into this with an open mind, but really it was, the, it was a question, four, four questions that fundamentally, when we answered it with the best available data evidence that we could find, led to a decision that we were going to remain generally unarmed uh, in New Zealand. So that style and tone of policing um, really has remained so because of the evidence base. But it then led us to be able to reset things and say, okay, well, our people are screaming out for the support, they don't feel safe. Um, we want them to be in a position where they do feel safe and they are safer. So 
the, our response um, uh, side of the business, working with uh, the, our centre, has developed something called the tactical response model, which has got three key pillars to it um, around improvements in tactical intelligence uh, that is delivered to our frontline uh, staff, um, our frontline safety enhancement, which is five days of training delivered over the course of a year, which is heavily based on, uh, heavily scenario uh, based. Um, and then the introduction of dedicated prevention teams, so tactical, uh, tactical prevention teams and tactical dog teams. Um, that, as I said earlier, we actually had a seat at the table when those conversations first happened. So not only are we able to build a, um, a, an evaluation framework um, that will help us measure the impact of that over the course of time, um, we're, actually, we're actually building a performance um, measurement framework as well as an add-on to, to some work that we're doing in the performance space that will track the delivery of armed policing over the long term. So really getting our uh, ducks in a row around the data. Um, so I think that's a really good example of how the organisation, you know, we established EBP in 2017 in name, 2018-19 we op operationalised it, things didn't go quite as well, but you can see working inside just how we, we're moving. So we're, we've seen a bit of a step change there. As I said earlier, uh, our indigenous population make up approximately 40% of our population um, and uh, really overrepresented in our, our criminal justice system. And um, there was a real catalyst event for us, um, even as far away as New Zealand. And that was the murder of um, George Floyd. Um, I remember at the time being on a whole lot of um, uh, conferences, uh, phone conferences, because COVID had just hit, and I was speaking to jurisdictions around the world about what some of the challenges that they were facing. And one of the sort of sentiments, and it was only a couple of days after the, this incident, um, was that it's a US policing issue, um, it'll sort of pass, and we don't sort of see those challenges in Australia, New Zealand. And we actually saw that change significantly in a few days. It was protests around the world, as we all know. Um, New Zealand wasn't immune to that. We saw significant protests in New Zealand. Same types of themes um, were coming out, um, bias and policing um, on who and how we stop people, uh, the over-representation of um, minority communities in our criminal justice system, uh, use of force statistics against our indigenous population. And we saw large protests in New Zealand. So our commissioner at, at that point, one first thing he asked me to do was um, refresh our leaders' knowledge around legitimacy and consent. So I started, I started working through that um, and followed the, a lot of the work from um, Professor Tankerby and, and Sir Anthony Bottoms. And that was a really good step change for us, but we needed something more. Um, so the Commissioner uh, posed the question to um, Deputy Chief Executive Mark Evans, um, who unfortunately can't be here today, um, but uh, how do we ensure that we build an evidence base in New Zealand that we stop talking past each other, and I think the Commissioner touched on that last night, is um, we, we don't really have a firm evidence base in New Zealand, apart from justice statistics, but some of these underlying issues that the community keep raising about, well, why are we stopped more? Um, why is force used more against us? Why aren't the charging decisions equitable for our communities? And, and a lot of it was um, us being a little bit defensive, I suppose, and saying, well, you know, uh, we sort of deal with what's in front of us. Um, being mindful of those structural issues that sit within, um, uh, you know, Ministry of Health and Education and all of those other things that are also impacting um, our minority community. So we set up um, a large piece of research. It's um, going to be uh, across about four or five years. Um, it's been planned out for. It's been led by um, Sir Kim Workman, um, who has been a justice advocate in New Zealand for about 40 years. He's an ex-police officer, um, then moved into academia. He's worked in um, prisons. So he, he chairs an independent panel which has a number of representatives from the academic community, but also our indigenous community and community leaders. And their role really is to help us shape the research. They're there to um, ensure that it is rigorous and transparent and that when those findings come back to police, and they will be coming back probably in tranches, so we're not going to sort of wait four or five years for those results, but they will come back in tranches, that the police will actually do something with them. Um, because we are like a lot of other countries, we've had um, commissioners' inquiries, we've had reports written by a number of departments, and not a lot of those findings are actually ever implemented, and there's a range of reasons um, that sit in behind that, but there's a real intent for us as an organisation um, to make, start making some step changes in this area. So we've got the independent panel. Um, I chair the research steering group, which is um, made up of a number of people within our own organisation at senior leadership level. 
um, to ensure that when these independent researchers need access to our people, they need access to data, um, that it's done safely and we, you know, we comply with um, uh, Official Information Act and, and privacy, etc. Um, but they do have access to that because I know it's a big challenge in, in research that a lot of the time just getting hold of police data is extremely hard. So um, there's been a sort of an agreement that they will have access to police data and they will have access to our people to actually understand some of those challenges. The third group, which I think is extremely important um, to this research, is we've set up an operational advisory group. So that's chaired by an operational area commander, and it's got detectives, constables, sergeants from across New Zealand that sit um, within this advisory group, and they are able to speak to the researchers about some of the challenges that they're facing um, in communities. Um, it allows the researchers to ask those questions about, well, how do you go out into your patrol and how do you choose who you're going to stop how do you make um, uh, decisions about who you're going to use force against? And then again, at the other end is how do you make charging decisions? Because we've, we've had a big step change in New Zealand about looking at supported resolutions and restorative justice to try and keep people out of the criminal justice system. Um, but again, those outcomes are not always equitable for all communities. So three key, area, three key areas that we're looking at, um, who and how we stop and engage with people. Uh, the second area is use of force decisions um, and understanding why our indigenous population are overrepresented in, in force that's used both non-lethal and lethal. And the third area is charging decisions to understand why there's this um, disparity between equitable outcomes. Um, so it's an exciting piece of work. It's been extremely complex to get it to the, to the point we're at now. We've just had two large... Um, uh, literature reviews completed one internationally, um, Dr Lisa Thompson um, completed that for us and then we've had a grey literature review completed uh, from a New Zealand perspective and be mindful um, our evidence base and uh, literature in this space is, is quite limited in New Zealand. A lot of international research so um, for us it's going to be a real opportunity to sort of build our, our own, um, own evidence base. The other thing that to support that um, work is um, about Two years ago, we partnered with the Ministry of Justice to design um, a police um, trust and confidence survey um, that focused on the four pillars of legitimacy. Um, we've just had the first tranches of results come back into our organisation, so there's 16 key questions that we go out and ask uh, a range of New Zealanders that may not have had contact with police, because prior to this we used to only survey people that had had contact with police. So the Ministry of Justice run an annual survey that we have a police module in there, um, and it's a very, very large sample size. Um, and as I say, we've just had the first tranche come back, and that will be, um, I think, a really good um, opportunity to sort of see the impact that this uh, understanding policing delivery is having, as, uh, I suppose, as one view. Um, but it was a real gap for us to actually understand what was um, driving some of those trust and confidence challenges. And, and when you sort of frame it up around legitimacy, um, it, it's a lot easier to translate that back into the organisation and start making some of those step changes that we're after. Another thing that um, probably around the journey that we've had um, is the political support um, that we need to make this happen. Um, because as you can appreciate, police resources um, uh, are stretched at the moment, so to have sort of 60 people focused on this within our organisation, um, we've been very fortunate that we've had the political support as well. But um, one of the jobs that Simon and I had to lead through the COVID pandemic, and New Zealand had probably some of the most strictest restrictions in the world, um, was we were informing government on compliance, um, how New Zealanders were complying to these restrictions, um, to allow government to make some key policy decisions um, about um, other legislation that they may need to bring in um, to keep um, communities safe and that went on for probably about 18 months I think. Um, at some times uh, there was a period of about four months that uh, Auckland was in lockdown, it was a seven day a week job but what that really started to change and, and some of the products that we also complemented that, that data with uh, around some of the impacts that we were seeing in family harm, um, mental health, um, we saw it when we had our general, general election in 2020, both major political parties in New Zealand under law enforcement um, commitments talked to that they would support evidence-based policing. So both sides of the political divide um, had it in their political manifestos. And it was only the other day that our Prime Minister was talking about um, gang tensions in Auckland and about different legislation that they were considering. Um, you know, there's uh, a big debate in New Zealand at the moment about bringing some of the Australian legislation 
Um, and and, and uh, our Prime Minister started talking about the fact that she wanted a strong evidence base before she was going to make some of those really big decisions that, again, were likely to have impacts on um, our Indigenous population as well. So um, it, just, it, it sort of just highlights for us the importance of um, not just enabling our organisation, but the part that we've played to en enable our government with a pretty, um, a pretty challenging time back in, back in NZ. When we, uh, Bruce and I, uh, sat down right at the start of the pandemic, and um, I, I remember the conversation, we were, we were saying, if evidence-based policing can't help at a time like this where we've got a global pandemic, when can it help? So we sat, we sat down and say, well, look, we've got the societies of evidence-based policing, in the, or certainly the four major ones that cover the Five Eyes uh, countries. Can we work together um, to collaborate on something that is a concern for everybody with people um, behind closed doors and, and locked down? So we, we pulled the, the societies of evidence-based policing together and uh, thanks to Larry and many others in this room who were part of that, we were able to pull together um, uh, this command information for police leaders on some of the best available evidence around family harm uh, and policing domestic violence. Um, we were able to put um, a webinar on and, and, and host a discussion, but really that's become a catalyst, I think, for um, a broader collaboration across um, certainly Australia and New Zealand. Um, we've got uh, Dave Cowan up next, who um, we we'll look, we'll look forward to hearing from, who's the president of the Australian New Zealand Society of Evidence-Based Policing. Um, but if it's good enough for um, the, the, the medical world to grow our understanding of what works in terms of the pandemic response, it should be fundamental to policing as well, that collaboration across the societies, across countries. If Victoria Police are testing something in the focused deterrence space, Let's replicate it in New Zealand at the same time or wherever in the UK. Um, so I'd like to see us move to that. So we've got, um, uh, we're, we're putting on a, a global conference hopefully later in the year and uh, Alex Murray who's at the back of the room and I were on a call quite early this morning uh, pushing that forward. So um, look, out for, uh, look out for that. I might mention it if we've got some time later on. Operational performance framework. So um, I, was, I had a great conversation uh, over dinner last night with some of our MPCC colleagues around data. And I would say the thing that I've lost the most sleep around um, over the last couple of years has probably been data. Um, we haven't got a single enterprise view in New Zealand where all our data is nice and ordered and available and we can join the dots um, across people and, and places far from it. Um, so we've worked really hard over the last couple of years with um, our data science team uh, and our performance team to build and reimagine an operational performance framework that will help link our operational activity and our outputs through to the impacts that we want to see in the short term and then link those through to um, the outcomes that we want to see around being the safest country. So we talk about safe homes, safe roads, safe communities on, uh, on our business uh, that you've seen there. We launched that at the end of last year. So there's about 200 measures, some of them are composite, some of the measures that we've launched and that the exec police executive signed off um, uh, don't actually have any data sources, they are aspirational, um, but it's allowed us to um, implement uh, the New Zealand Crime Harm Index, which was created in 2017, um, and we're very lucky to have um, now Dr Sophie curtis Ham. Um, who's uh, just finished her PhD, uh, working in the centre. And so we've, we've, we've actually um, embedded the Crime Harm Index into a lot of the measures that sit within um, the performance framework. And if our mission is to reduce and prevent crime and harm, how do you measure harm? So, um, Bruce, if you want to... The Crime Harm Index has been a bit of a step change for our organisation. Um, uh, when it first was developed from a New Zealand perspective, um, it sort of it wasn't adopted initially. Um, but we've done a lot of work in allowing our leaders to better understand how they can uh, measure harm in their communities by using the by new, using the New Zealand Crime Harm Index um, rather than just looking at single crime count. That you know, I know for the students you're going to learn about a little bit more. But we've built Simon and I have built that purposefully in our operational performance framework. So our leaders get two views: they get the harm index view and they also get volume view. Um, and it's been a real good conversation um, with our organisation. We've still got a lot of work to do um, because our senior leaders are, are used to looking at volume. Um, but I think we're on the right. 
we're on the right right track. This is the latest view. Um, I think it's still better, but um, it's the latest view about how we're enabling our leaders to make strategic decisions around crime trends and and and, and in harm. Uh, but we're also developing an operational level, so it'll be um, available for our operational staff and drop down boxes and. Um, our data scientists have done some fancy things about um, moving moving trends around. Yeah, and what's in I mean, the work that we've been involved in, it's, it's, that we're about to switch an Azure uh, Cloud London platform on over in the next couple of months or so, which is which is going to it's going to be a game changer around um, our people being able to access data. Um, there's a number of projects that you can see that we've completed over the the last couple of years. I think the point here is that um, we work in partnership with universities um, across New Zealand and, and beyond where we can. Um, the rapid evidence reviews that we've done with the University of Queensland. So I don't know whether any of you have heard of the Global Policing Database. Um, it's housed at the University of Queensland. Um, it's a fantastic uh, bit of kit. Um, and it's probably got, it's probably a, the repository that's got 350,000, I think, um, individual pieces of evidence, both published and grey literature in there, where police, have par police or police have partnered um, uh, on trying to solve problems around crime and harm. That, we've done about 15 of those, I think, um, with the University of Queensland over the last couple of years, and it's been used by our police executive to um, write the framework and the strategy for the future of policing around um, Auckland, which is where we've got about two thirds of the population in New Zealand living. But it's also being used by our frontline troops where we're looking at solving problems like nighttime economy uh, harm in, in, in Wellington. The work here is a whole tranche of uh, pieces that we did with the University of Canterbury around fleeing drivers. So um, for the operational people in the room, um, there's nothing quite like that feeling of a vehicle failing to stop is the um, and I know it's been quite a topical uh, thing in uh, both northern and uh, southern hemispheres over uh, the last couple of years, but uh, we, did a, took, we took a, a number of different approaches, tranched this work out, and the findings have been put back into the training um, of our, op our operational training around um, uh, fleeing drivers and, and pursuit management. We've also got, um, and Bruce, Bruce will talk a bit more um, about this, we've also got a real issue in New Zealand around um, the harm that methamphetamine causes. Um, and again, we've tranched this work out. And we were talking to people last night actually saying, you know, people, police leaders want answers yesterday, don't they? Um, you know, we've got this problem, what's, what, what's the evidence say? And we found that actually taking a tranched approach where, where you, people can almost touch we're going to get the first bit of information here. In six months' time, we'll have some, uh, a bit more data analysis done. Um, and that's been quite a helpful um, approach, I think. Yeah, I suppose the only other point I'd make on that um, is Simon and I were sitting at the centre one day and we had a seasoned detective, 40 years in the mm. job, come down and literally sat down and said, look, I'm exhausted. I've been working in the space um, for the last 20 years. I'm extremely frustrated. Every time I try and get funding for new projects, the first thing they'll ask is, what's your evidence base? Um, so we didn't have a large evidence base in New Zealand about the impacts that methamphetamine were having, not only on the users, but on the crime, uh, the, as a driver of crime. So um, this, this work, is, as Simon said, is going to be delivered, well, the first tranche has already been delivered, the next two tranches are, are going to be delivered over the next sort of 12 to 18 months. But fundamentally, that will allow um, uh, that evidence base for treatment programs, not only by community providers, but um, a Ministry of Health. Um, it's the, the first... Um, uh, tranche that was published um, was the first time in New Zealand's history that there was actually a robust evidence base about the impacts that it was having on our communities. Went right up to government level, so it's been a, it's probably for me it's been um, one of the best pieces of work I've seen come out of the centre. It's been multi-agency um, collaboration, uh, data sharing. Um, we've had quite a significant um, input from uh, University of Otago that look after the 40-year long, longitudinal study out of Dunedin and Christchurch. So it's, it's, it's been a fundamental piece of work. And to see a seasoned detective come and ask us that question to help him um, was, I think, something that we were really proud of, that we'd sort of had that influence. And I, th I think one of the things that, 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 that's made that a success is there's, I think, there's 26 different agencies across New Zealand represented on that. Just very quickly, one of the tranches, this is tranche three, we looked at 56,000 offenders um, who had been charged uh, with and without um, meth offences. And you can see that for both... For, for people who were charged with meth offences, the volume and the, uh, the, 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 their prevalence and the harm that they cause, seven, seven times more crime harm, five times as prevalent as offenders that aren't charged 
uh, with meth offences. And when you take that offender cohort and look at how they've been victimised themselves, you can see there's a greater, uh, greater level of harm and, and, and victimisation there as well. Just a very quick nod, Larry, to some work that Simon Welsh has been leading for us around our rural offices. So we've got 123, one, two, three person stations that cover about 50% of the geography of New Zealand. Um, they've kind of been the poor cousins. So we've embedded our service design team um, with, with, a, with a transformation project around rural policing to redesign what rural policing looks like for, for, um, for New Zealand, how that's going to be delivered. And right at the heart of that is uh, the evidence around community policing. Uh, thanks very much for the very, very good uh, presentation, Simon and Bruce. I was wondering, jumping back to your hotspots policing pilot, you said the officers patrol for 15 minutes twice a day. Why did you choose that? Why 15 minutes a day and why twice a day? Why 15 minutes? Um, so that, that evidence really um, is very, very well tested. Um, so it come, comes from, starts back way back in 1989 uh, when Larry ran a hotspots experiment in the US and then Chris Coper came along six years later and said, oh, 15 minutes looks like the ideal amount of time to create that initial deterrence. And it was then retested um, in uh, Birmingham some years later and uh, Renee Mitchell was involved in some testing in the, in the US as well. And now we, we took that to Western Australia where we looked at not just the initial deterrence of, around the day that officers patrol, but actually what's the sweet spot in terms of you know, how often you have to go back. Do you have to keep going back every single day? And what we found there was that actually you can go and put that additional patrol in two 15-minute visits and then not go back for up to four days. But by God, if you don't go back uh, after that, all hell breaks loose, I think was the phrase that we, uh, we used where you see crime harm just blow out. How are you going to know when you're the safest country in the world? Well, I think the Commissioner talked about it um, last night. It's a very aspirational um, goal. Um, there are different surveys that you see come around um, uh, the world that sort of rank us pretty highly. I think it's an ongoing journey for us in, in New Zealand because we do have um, different emerging crime types. I think globally, if you look at the emergence of cybercrime, um, I think we, you know, we've got a lot of work to prepare ourselves for that. So there'll be different expectations from the public about getting ourselves in a, in a, a position to be able to um, respond to that. So I think it's aspirational and it's an ongoing. It doesn't stop. Okay. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Yeah, really interesting um, presentation. You mentioned earlier about the digital checklist that you've implemented. Have you as yet had the opportunity to look at the access um, by officers and whether it differs according to demographic? Are you seeing a greater access in younger officers, for example, or difference across genders, um, and how you might sort of measure that going forward? And if, if I might add to that, um, are you monitoring the performance of the people who access it in different ways? So it's a really good question and a bone of contention for us as well. So the way that the ICT infrastructure works in the background, everything goes back to one server in Auckland. So we can't actually track at the moment in great detail um, who's, using, who's using what. We just get very high level um, kind of metadata coming out of that. It's, it's something that we are planning to work on over the next year or so to understand actually how that's being used and whether we then see, depending on usage, difference in outcomes by area and district. We can see, we can see job titles. So there's a mix of um, constabulary members, some analysts, mm -hmm and then um, some support staff. So you can sort of see at a high level the type of jobs that people are having. So it's a real mix, but it is growing. You know, Simon's sort of saying 500 a week, and uh, we do see small um, implement, uh, increments uh, as we progress. I, I think your, your suggestion talk, talks to something I have in my mind a lot, that, that actually a great performance, or your underperformance, or even your minority of corrupt or dishonest officers are hidden in plain view as far as the data is concerned. And it's very important to look at it organisationally, um, team and, and uh, personal.